afternoon. Welcome to our talk on modernising the MarTech stack. Thank you for taking the time out of your afternoon to listen to our talk. Um, before we kick off, a uh, couple of introductions. I'm Natalie, Chief Experience Officer from Sagittarius. Yeah, and I'm Nicola. I'm from Sitecom. I'm the Senior Director of Solution Engineering. That means I'm basically on the sales side, but I've worked as an ISPOS previously, so I been on the after sales, I know all your pages. The soft sell. Yeah, soft sell. <laughs> cool, so just to go through the agenda quickly for you guys. So we're going to kick off by talking about modernising the MarTech stack, and what does that mean? Um, and then I want to touch on something I call the composable conundrum. We're going to look at where you are, we're going to touch on headless, and then we're going to briefly touch on preparing for the future. So before we kick off, I want you to introduce yourselves. Um, we're going to be using Mentimeter for this, so we'll be using it throughout the course of the speech. Um, I've also got some goodie bags here um, for uh, our site Corian t-shirts, cult classics, modelled here wonderfully by such people as Dave O'Flanagan, Tamas and Jacqueline Baxter, if you know, you know. Um, so anybody who's willing to put their hands up and answer some questions, you get a goodie bag, t-shirts for you, you, you and you. So before we kick off, Let's jump over to Mentimeter. So fingers crossed this works, guys. Scan the QR code. Cool. All right. So we're going to kick off with the first question, which is not showing on screen, unfortunately. I do want to get a sense of who we've got in the room. So first question is, who are you? Prospective client to Sitecore? Existing client to Sitecore? Sitecore partner? Or are you a Sitecoreian? We've got quite a few Sitecore partners in the room. Lots of existing clients. Cool. So all of those cycle partners that are not Sagittarius, there's an exit there and there. Feel free to depart. <laughs> I jest. Uh, okay. And secondly, what is your role? Just to get a sense of kind of who's in the ro in the room, so we can kind of ensure we're talking accordingly. Well, lots of tech people, some marketing people, C suites, strategy teams, and others. A lot of tech people and some marketing. Cool. Brilliant. Okay, so now I just need to get back to that. Apologies. Cool. So now that we've got a sense of the people that are in the room, I think we should um, give a little bit of context to the yeah. talk. Yeah. So this is more fundamentally a marketing conversation and it's really about trying to alleviate some of those anxieties about those big buzzwords that are kind of going around um, the community at the moment. So that is the kind of core concept and content of the uh, topic today. So we're going to start with modernising the MarTech stack. What does that mean? So to start, I think it's really important to get a definition of what MarTech is. Um, so Gartner determines MarTech as a set of integrated technologies that enables marketing capabilities, um, efficiency, and to deliver effectively. So it's kind of the modules that kind of connect together. So we've got a definition of what MarTech is. Um, and then I just want to touch on how, where are we with MarTech? How has it evolved? So Scott Brinker has been um, mapping the MarTech landscape since 2011. And you can see that there's been a huge evolution um, of MarTech tools within that period of time. So within 10 to 11 years, we've gone from roughly 150 tools to nearly 10,000. That's a significant amount. That's a lot to take on board, and it's quite complicated and confusing. It's also a lot of option, which can naturally bring on anxieties. We've also seen that the type of tool has, and focus has kind of shifted from data and content to the connection between those two and the experience and the context that that can deliver. So it's really important to keep that in mind. So if we've evolved from 150 to nearly 10,000 tools in this saturated market, how can we modernize the MarTech stack? And what does that even mean? Well, why don't you guys tell me? So back to Mentimeter. <coughs> Please give us five keywords um, that uh, infers the type of thing that MarTech stack means to you guys. And anybody willing to stand up and give us your view, you get a goodie bag. Hands up, anyone? Come on, cult classics. 
and I have the day. Okay, we've got simplification, chat BT, pink, yeah. Scale, <laughs> innovate, cross channel, agility, consolidate. I'm really sorry, this um, should be shown on the screen, but I'll try and read them out as much as possible. Simplification is standing out a lot. Agility, composable, marketing automation, customer experience, CX, Mac. Composable. Modular, composable. <laughs> Personalization. Cool. Fast paced, dynamic. Brilliant. Pink is my favorite. <laughs> you get a t shirt later. Yeah. Maybe. Wear it to the drinks. <laughs> Such terrorist. <time. laughs> cool. All right. Cost. Yes. Agility. Omni channel. Amazing. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm sorry you can't see it, but I'm going to jump into now you guys have told me nobody was brave enough to stand up. We're going to roll into an expert view. Um, so I spoke to some of the key players within our agency to give me their perception of what modernizing the MarTech stack means. So here we go. The average marketing organization has something like 91 different technologies in its marketing stack. And if you also factor in the fact that perhaps 60% of that isn't really being used in anger, then for me, modernizing the marketing stack is all about, you know, reducing that down as much as possible, simplifying it, doing more with less and using that simplification to create amplification. So from my perspective, modernizing the MarTech stack uh, is less about a one size fits all approach for all, cl all clients, and more about aligning the needs for your specific marketing platform with the current MarTech vendor solutions and defining a roadmap towards implementation. For me, modernizing the MarTech stack is absolutely fundamental to delivering omnichannel experiences that convert. In the past seven to 10 years, I've seen an increasing number of businesses with MarTech stacks that have become unmanageably bloated, ironically, in an effort to streamline, minimize friction and improve performance. Modernizing the MarTech stack is not always simply about adding or adopting the next shiny platform that claims to save you time and budget, bring you closer to your customers or drive more revenue. More often than not, Integrating more and more new platforms with a legacy stack causes an exponential increase in the challenges faced by technologists and marketers alike. I think Colin Chapman, the former Lotus boss, said it best when he said, simplify, then add lightness. It's the technological improvements, i.e. the products, the service offerings of the current marketing technologies you currently use or are aware of that enable you to better manage, execute, measure and improve your marketing efforts. To me, modernizing the MarTech stack means putting the infrastructure in place to be able to talk to your customers in a consistent way, no matter what channel they're using. So over 70% of users today access digital content across multiple devices. So consistent and personalized content really does matter. The upshot of having a modern MarTech stack means having a 360 degree of your customers and being able to treat them as individuals. So the irony on the fact that all of them is men, are men is not lost on me, but they're on normal stage. So come on, women. So some of the key words that we could pull out of some of that, and really some of the key messages are around using what you've got to its fullest, leveraging its capabilities, simplifying that so that actually you can amplify all of your efforts. Um, it's that integration between the modular components, the component parts, and the utilization of data. So there are a couple of keywords that obviously stand out here, agility, composability, and headless. So obviously to modernize the MarTech stack, there's a crucial part in this. This is the composability, which brings me on to something I wanna talk about called, I call the composable conundrum. Um, for me, I feel like the word <coughs> composable is um, anxiety inducing for a lot of people because it's really confusing to determine what it is. Is it a thing? Is it a destination? Is it finite? Is it something that can evolve and change? Or is it achievable? So my, in my view, composable is a bit of a red herring in this scenario, because being composable is a multitude of things. It's composable thinking, it's composable business architecture, and it's composable technologies. But being composable is not the technology play. It's about business agility, organizing your tech stack, to make your business more agile. 
Now, an element of that is what we might call the composable DXP, which brings me on to composable recycle. Yeah, and if and we found this on the cycle website, to be honest. That's the definition of what does it mean to be composable. And that's what we're going to try to debunk a bit, to say what does it actually mean to be composable, and to look at it from a view from a non-technical perspective of what does it mean on your technical stack? What does it mean for that? One of the definitions you see here is that a composable DXP is cloud native, SaaS, that's something you will have heard today if you've been in there. Uh, it's best of breed, it's modular, and it integrates via APIs. Um, this is site cost definition. Some of you will probably claim there's different definitions and so on. So I'll try to narrow down on some of these words and actually go a little bit deeper into them. So please, if you want to do the next one. So, one of the things I chose to say, we should describe what does it mean high level to be composable. First of all, it's modular. Obviously, it nearly speaks for itself that something, if it's composable, then it's modular. It's something you take, you take some bricks and you stitch them together to something bigger. And now everyone is probably going to say, but that's what we already got, right? We've got an infrastructure based on different pieces. So you might already be composable today, or at least on your way of being composable because you have an infrastructure consisting of different modules. But when we get to the next one, is it your best of breed modules you're actually using for it? Or is it legacy systems? Or would you actually like to use something else instead, but you can't because you're stuck and you're stuck into certain legacy systems that you're forced to use. And they are maybe not that easy to actually exchange. And that might be because they're actually integrated. They're integrated in a bad way with tight couplings, where if you move one piece, well, the rest of them will start falling apart. I don't know if any of you can recognize this in your system. So suddenly it also becomes hard to upgrade these kind of different modules, because if you upgrade one, it will have a significant effect on something else. So you're suddenly locked in on specific systems to use that. So what I'm saying is that integration is not necessarily only a good thing, but you need to do integration in the right way, with loose couplings, where you encapsulate your system as an atomic module. It's, if, if you were in university uh, for solution architecture, you would say it's a separation of concerns where each module handles one thing, and they communicate with the other modules, but not more tightly coupled than you can remove it and replace it with something else. So being really composable actually means that it's lightweight and you can exchange them based on your needs. So that should actually force that you can use best of breed anytime. So lightweight, and I added SaaS. Do you need to have SaaS solution to be composable? No, but it makes it significantly easier if it is. Because if you have someone running it in the cloud for you, it will be much, much easier to exchange because the only way you can actually integrate with it is through these loose couplings, through what you call microservices in the APIs. So that is why we're bringing SaaS on as a definition as some of the key components to call yourself composable. This next one. This one, you've seen something similar earlier today, and this is obviously mapping out the components of Sitecore that we see that each is a component. And this is the direction we are moving in, that each thing we are actually trying to create as a separate thing that you can exchange. If you go on and put something on it, then you see now, let's say which, now I said best of breeds, which kind of concerns is this actually about? So instead of mapping it to a product name, we try to map it out here to say which, what is it actually solving for you in your composable infrastructure? And if you go further beyond, you will see that there might actually be other stuff that is not site code based. So the whole thing about creating an infrastructure that's composable is not necessarily to say we have a better together story, yes, but you might not necessarily need to use site code for everything. You can use one component and fit it into your current infrastructure and build them together. And as you can see, there are def definitely areas here we don't cover. You might even have an Adobe one or maybe this is a composable CMS here. Now, 
That's so right, absolutely lunatic and saying it could be contemporary instead of psychical. That would be quite stupid, right? Yeah, you but, but, but actually, we are so confident in this approach here, right, that we believe that this is the way to do it, that do it in a way so it's changeable. Okay? Yep. So essentially, you might see yourselves in this scenario. You might recognize where you are in this. You might be using tools like MailChimp even, instead of Adobe, and that is connecting in with your existing CMS. So really, it could you could perceive yourself as composable already. So if we were to rate where you are, um, what I've done is created five categories of where you might sit within composability. So we've got, on the one side, completely composable. This is totally modern, completely integrated, it's seamless integrations, you're leveraging all of that data to create wonderful, headless, ex omni-channel experiences that resonates with your customer at all time. On the flip side, you might be bound to a monolithic CMS, and this could be for various reasons. It could be the amount of integrations, the amount of bespoke coding and so on that makes it very difficult to kind of step away from that. It could be anything to do with your stakeholders and management and the lack of buy-in. That's totally monolithic. In the middle, we've got the half and half, which is we're using a monolithic CMS, and that integrates with some external tools. It could be um, Adobe for mark, um, automation and so on. You're using data to drive experiences. And then, of course, there's the two in between, somewhat composable and mostly monolithic. So if we were to jump over to Mentimeter, Right, your architecture, we've already done this, really cool. <laughs> so we can see that there's a significant amount of people um, on the totally, towards the totally monolithic side. There's mo the most people up and down between half and half, which by the way is my favorite Domino's pizza, um, because I can never decide. Um, and also we've got a lot of people sitting in mostly mon monolithic, which is kind of makes sense as to where we are at the moment. We've got a lot of clients on XP or other systems that are bound to this for lots of reasons, lots of legacy reasons, but they may well be looking to evolve their marketing tech stack and their solutions. Cool. Anybody it, want to put that like hand up? It's like 85% of these two categories. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Anybody want to put their hand up and state where they are? Free goodie bag. Tracy Ann, they're not selling. We need to evolve our marketing. Yes. Right, next. Yeah, you're not invited. Bye bye. Uh, cool. All right, so we've got a good sense of where people are. They're sort of half and half composable, mostly monolithic. Um, so we've got a sense of what composable is, what modernizing the Martech stack is, and one of the key elements and enablers of composable is headless. Yeah. I kind of did the same with this because what is headless then? Right? Uh, let, let us first try to define it. You can probably define that in many ways as well. But you can see which words have been highlighted here. It is that it separates the back end from the front end. And the back end is your systems. It could basically be all the systems you show in the composable architecture. You could actually see that as your back end. Where your front end, that's all your channels. That's where you deliver something, that where you meet your customers. It could be websites, it could be emails, it could be apps, uh, a lot of things, yes, please. So, so if we should do a very, very high level explanation on how is a traditional CMS, now we're using a CMS as an example here. Well, you can see the back end and the front end are tightly covered here. This is one system handling both the delivery of the website, but also managing all the content in the back end at the same thing and it can deliver to web. That's what it does. It's a one-trick poem, basically, and you need to use this one if you want to create a website, where if you go to a headless approach, what we're trying to illustrate here is that the back end and the front end are separated here, and they communicate kind of in the same way as I explained with Composable. They communicate through an API, so they are lightweight in a way that they are not tightly coupled. They are separated. The idea of this is that when you create a front-end solution, you do not necessarily do it within a specific system and the way that actually enforces you to do it. So that means you can create solutions for basically any channels. 
going back, picking up data through a simple API and presenting it on the front end. That's how headless in a way works. So if we go to the next one, please. So you can say headless is part of the composable architecture concept. And again, I think this time in words, maybe more phrases. But what I'm saying is that are you headless? Are you not headless? Of course, you can be 100% headless. Or you can be 0% headless. But in a way, headless is a way of thinking. It's a mindset. It's a philosophy. When you're going to create something for a front end, let's say you want to create a website. Now we are in very much in the CMS world. Maybe it's going to just be a small, fast website. And if you start thinking about it, how can I make this most headless as possible? Because that will give me the freedom later and it will make me do it faster. How can I create it with the least, what should you say, where it's the least cobbled to a specific system in my underlying stack? Because what I need, I need content, and I probably need data. And if you're really composable, and you're utilizing headless on top of it, you can basically pick any content from any system you have available, and you can pick any data to create your website. And it doesn't become tightly cobbled into a specific system. So it's detached, but in a way still integrated, just like the composable parts between it. So we have been talking, I have myself been doing that, been talking so many years now about being omnichannel. As someone uses the omnichannel Nirvana, that's what we're all striving for, right? That is to say that all of the content we have can be used in all our channels. We want to be multi-channel. That is actually what Hitless does for you. It makes it possible to pick the same content you have in your backend stack, the composable DXP. And Furthermore, we want to be more than multi-channel. We want to be omni-channel. We want these experiences in the different channels to be connected contextually. So if you're in one channel, they recognize you in the next channel. That's what you need your data for. This needs to be shared as well and be available. So if you're fully, truly headless, you actually have access to all the content and all the data in your underlying composable DXP. And that is what we're striving to actually achieve on the channel, Nirvana, yeah, right? And there's a lot of benefits to that. And one of them is obviously the faster time to market. Because I think most of you have tried to get up a website fast. And then you have a system like Sitecore XP, for example, the ones that we need to do it here. Then you need to activate Sitecore developers. You need to go into a release schedule. You need to do all these kinds of things that slows down the process. If you work on a headless basis, you can basically create this front end in any, with any technology and let someone do it and just use the API to get the data. So it's significantly faster to get something done. So some of the numbers we see is that, I don't know if it's 80% is precise, but at least someone tried that and tried to measure on this, and I would actually claim that the number is higher. But they actually experienced that they're faster than four. We actually had two in here who said that we are fully composable in the Mentimeter we did before. I don't know who that is, but maybe you can confirm this, that it actually works. Is there anyone here? You'll get a free pack. Nobody wants them. Okay. Okay. No, but that is kind of, so you can say headless is the enabler of your composable infrastructure to actually achieve some benefits of this. I hope it makes sense in a way to explain why we should do this. Yeah. So, obviously, there are potentially multiple routes to headless, um, and that really depends on headless or composable. That really depends on where you are as a business, where your architecture sits, what your uh, stakeholder buy-in is, and so on and so forth, what your skills and processes and governance are. So, again, I've just tried to categorize where people might sit, um, and I've got three here. So, I've gone for the big bang. These are the people that you know, maybe they're on Sitecore XP and they're due to do a big upgrade and actually it's more cost efficient to um, rebuild, repurpose on something brand new, a brand new experience. It might be that you're migrating from one CMS to another and you've got the ability, the stakeholder buy and the investment to redesign the experience in its entirety. So you've got a big bang approach. On the flip side, you've got what I'm calling the on-prem gem. This is our old favorite um, Sitecore XP. 
um, and you're bound tightly to this for the various reasons that I mentioned before. Your, your business isn't in the right position. You haven't got that stakeholder buy-in yet. You haven't got your business case. You've got lots and lots of heavy integrations and bespoke coding. It's going to prevent a fast and efficient m migration away from that. So that's your on-prem gem and the in-between. So we have we work with clients in both in all three of these areas. And the half and half are those businesses that might be bound to the on-prem gem for various reasons. They've got bespoke commerce set up and so on. But actually, they've got the opportunity that their business has other elements to it. It's a, their business might be split into slightly two different offerings. And it gives them the, op the opportunity to test and learn with a new architecture, a new way of thinking, a new composable mindset. So that's the half and half. So we're back to Mentimeter. This is your last chance, guys, to get one of our wonderful Sitecorian bags. So back to Mentimeter. Which classification do you identify with? The Big Bang, the Half and Half, or the On-Prem Gem? Well, we've got lots and Half and Half, so that gives you lots I, of opportunities. I favorite pizza, right? It's yeah, it's my favorite, yeah, yeah. You don't know what to choose. Yeah, I'm decisive. I like to try both, you know? Cool. So we are up to 24, well, yeah. and only four and four on the other, so everything. Significantly more in the half and half. Cool. All right. Sounds like a So we've got a good identification of where people are. Anybody want to stick their hands up? No. Let's move on. Um, so roots to headless then. Um, obviously, if you are one of those lucky four in the big bang, you've got an, a, a huge, a really exciting opportunity to completely rebuild. This is the wholesale change. You've got lots of investment um, and uh, stakeholder buy-in. So essentially, you need to ensure that you are defining your, your omni-channel strategy and allowing that to build your business case. And that must be led by the customer, because if you're spending this much time and money designing a new experience, it has to be customer first. The benefits are obviously you've got a rapid evolution from one experience to the other, but it enables you for future. So future when you want to connect other elements, you've got a much higher, sorry, much faster time to market and a lot more scalability. And then we go back to our old friend, the on-prem gem. So the way is to convert. So if you are interested in understanding how headless can enable your marketing efforts, there are ways to do this, and really what you want to be looking at is refactoring some of your existing com uh, components, page templates, and so on. So to do this, you need to define your ambition. Why are you doing it? What's the purpose? What's the opportunity? Audit what you've got, and go through a process of keep, kill, and combine. What are those components, page templates, etc.? It's going to give you the most um, ability to connect with your consumers, the most longevity, something you might want to take into your new world. Um, and then start to refactor that, and then start to use it and monitor it. Make sure you can monitor the return on investment and the return on value. That gives you steady progression. It gives you time to evolve, and it allows time to build a business case for a much better big bang scenario later on. And the half and half guys, they kind of sit happily in the middle. Um, again, define the opportunity. There is an investment being made here. Make sure you've got the right stakeholder buy-in. Make sure you can monitor the return. So design the experience based on your customers, monitor that return, and incrementally, if it makes sense, start to migrate some of your on-prem gem experience into your new experience. So it's slow, steady, progressive, and you can really start to build the foundations and prove the concept and the return to your wider business. So, finally, preparing for the future. So we now know there are kind of three core categories in here. Um, my team and I are working on a framework for our customers that will help clients kind of self-identify where they are and the route and direction that they need to take. So we've been working on this framework um, and it starts with identifying whether you are the big bang, the half and half or the on-prem gem. I mean, then really it goes into what type of experience are you delivering? Is it a content experience, a data-led experience, or is it commerce-led? And this will help you identify the first uh, steps in your migration, the first parts of your roadmap that you need to, to build on, and the type of tools that you want to invest in. 
The next element is how bound are you to what you've got? Have you got heavy integrations that are very complicated to move away from? Or do you have the agility and the independence that you don't rely on lots of integrations to enable your experience? So are you min have minimal integrations or heavy integrations? And the final part is your business readiness score. So if we think about um, for all of those who have been with Sitecore for a long time, the Sitecore digital maturity model, it technically goes into five stages. So let's assume that's a 20% in each phase. Essentially, what we're trying to determine is your business ready. So if you're going through a digital transformation, for example, you'd be assessing your processes, your skills, your stakeholder buy-in. Have you got the right ambition, culture, um, and so on and so forth. So you can score that out of a percentage of around 65. So this guy, the big bang, He's in a great position, he's got loads of investment, loads of buy-in, the tools and processes are in the right place, and he's looking for a brand new content experience. So let's go down Excel and Cloud and maybe bolt on some personalization to elevate that message. However, our old friend, the on-prem gem, who has um, a bespoke um, commerce element and lots of heavy integrations, has to go through a slightly slower roadmap, slightly slower progression. And actually, their business isn't quite ready yet, so this helps us identify what needs to come first, and that's understanding culturally and from a business perspective what you need to put in place to evolve your MarTech stack. So it's the composable business and composable thinking that needs to come first. So when we know roughly which section you fall into, whether you're a content data or commerce-led um, experience, we can start to identify some of the cycle tools that might help you on that journey. And of course, I'm going back to our old SBOS days for those of you who know. Um, think Pi. If you're going to invest more tech, uh, sorry, MarTech tools into your stack, bearing in mind that the first um, slides we saw, there's a lot going on, really assess what's going to add the most value. Think Pi. What's the potential of that for your business? What's the impact of bringing it into your business? How easy is it going to be to bring that into your business and start to execute on it? So really, composable, it's a journey, it's not a destination. Um, and thanks to my friend Steve Bartlett, I've got some lovely graphs for you. So your growth or your change or evolution may look a bit like this, might look like this, might look like this, but it's likely to look a bit like this. There's going to be twists and turns and hurdles along the way, but that's normal. Don't feel intimidated or scared by it. It's part of the process. It's part of the learning process. And having really good partners and support systems at, at Sitecore and in the community, we can help you along the way. The good news is you're probably already composable, even if partially. So you're already on the journey. There is no set route, timeline, or approach. Now, this could be seen as oh, quite scary, but actually it's liberating because it means you can't compare yourself to anybody else. Every business is unique. All of your configurations and setups are unique. And working with the right partners and Sitecore means that we can build out the most effective and most efficient roadmap for you and your business. So again, whether that's supporting from the business side or simply the tech side. We can help, and this is the way. Thank you.